It's my great uh, privilege today to introduce Tony Tyson, who is at the University of California Davis in the physics department, and also the director of the LSST project, the Large Area Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is uh, what he's going to be talking about today. And in the interest of brevity, I'll limit the introduction to that. If you have any uh, questions, this is going to go up on uh, Google Video publicly, so if you have any uh, questions relevant to Google internal stuff, by all means, feel free to ask them, but please do so after the videotape is over. Thanks. Tony. Thanks, Rob. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, a new project to digitize all of the sky that's visible from Chile, which is a large part of the sky, uh, very deeply to the edge of the optical universe in 4D and deliver up that data um, first starting um, a year after it begins operation in about 2013. It's a big project. You can see um, various collaborating institutions here. They're growing. Um, there are three more now that are being added to that. Uh, it's a big project. Um, it started in 2000. The first meeting we had, this is sort of by comparison to the rest of my colleagues in astronomy, uh, where the first meetings on new projects are usually hardware meetings. Uh, the first meeting we had was a software meeting. And uh, you'll see why. So that's what the machine looks like. And uh, just for scale, uh, that's a person standing there. It's an eight and a half meter diameter primary mirror. And um, it's a new kind of optics. Uh, and I'll explain how that works in a minute. So 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, we couldn't even dream of doing this. And that's because of some breakthroughs that have occurred since then. And um, the first and obvious breakthrough is in microelectronics. That comes in twice in this machine. It comes in the focal plane with really big wide area detectors, billions of pixels, uh, very low noise. And it also comes in the many teraflops that one has to have on site and elsewhere to process and, and search the data. Um, needless to say, in this building, a very, very important part of this, probably the most important part of it, is the software. And then we couldn't even think of doing this without some breakthroughs in the engineering of large aspherical optics fabrication uh, that have come down the pike in the last 15 years. And you mix all these three together, and you can do something new. So in exploration, in astronomy anyway, uh, it's a huge three-dimensional universe. Space is very big. Uh, you've heard of explorations as a function of wavelength. You can think of x-ray, radio, optical explorations in angular resolution. One normally thinks of the Hubble, very good angular resolution. Um, Area surveyed. This is something that most of my colleagues in astronomy uh, these days um, don't and can't boast about, because as we've been building larger and larger telescopes, they've been looking at smaller and smaller fields of view. You take a look at this typical field of view of a very large state-of-the-art telescope. It's an arc minute, or a few arc minutes. And here we're talking about 10 square degrees. And depth. Go to the edge of the universe, edge of the detectable universe. Um, now, you can do any one of these things, usually, in some one facility, and that's the, tradi the tradition, uh, and that's because of technology. Uh, what we can do because of these breakthroughs is we can do uh, ser several of them, including time resolution, all at the same time. You can go wide, deep, and fast. You can choose any one of these and, 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 and come up with examples of what people have done, but we have to do all three in order to achieve our mission, and I'll show, I'll show you how we're going to do that. So this is a cartoon of the, of the telescope. It's been designed. Uh, uh, we have some funds from the National Science Foundation that started a year ago to do the design. And we're ready for a construction proposal that will be handed in in a couple of months. Uh, this is the uh, telescope. The light comes in. I'll show you in a minute uh, a ray trace. Comes in and it bounces off this huge primary mirror back up and bounces off a secondary mirror up here and then down off of a tertiary mirror and then back 
into the camera, which is shown in the right. And the camera has some optics in it too. This is an optical ray trace. So light comes in, now it's looking horizontal. Light comes in, bounces off M1, the big primary mirror, bounces off the secondary mirror, down off the tertiary mirror into the camera. And this particular design allows you to have an extremely large field of view and crisp images independent of wavelength all at the same time. And uh, it, it, it works really well. Um, we, we can also make huge mirrors. Here's an example of uh, some folks that made this piece, this eight and a half meters across. It's made in a rotating oven. You take chunks of Pyrex glass and put them in the oven and heat it up, rotate it and heat it up, and it becomes a parabola. And then you gradually cool it off and then polish, etch, uh, polish the mirror. Um, so we think we can do this. We're waiting for some upfront, um, a little bit more upfront f private funding to do this very long lead item. It has to start really this year. Um, this is the focal plane in the camera, and uh, this is a hundred million dollar camera, just the camera alone. Uh, the focal plane uh, looks like this. It's made out of all of these rafts. There's some approximately 190 separate detectors, each 4K by 4K for a, a full focal plane of 3.2 gigapixels. And that's, that's about uh, 65 centimeters across here. And lots of electronics. This whole thing gets read out in one to two seconds. And the image, images have to be processed uh, before the next exposure is taken. The exposures are very short. They're about 15 seconds long. The pixels are 10 microns. And 10 microns sub 10 is 0.2 arc seconds in the focal plane, uh, which is about the right sampling for the best sites on the Earth that deliver about 0.6 to 0.5 arc seconds full width at half maximum um, point spread functions. How many bits deep? 16 bits deep raw. Uh, very, very soon gets turned into 32 is immediately when you do math on them, and that gets done right up front. So a lot of data. So, so we jiggered the pixels this way so we could have some extra things in between them to measure the wavefront curvature. So we know precisely exactly where the where the wavefront is, uh, where the focal focal plane is relative to the uh, detector plane. And we have to know this to to about a micron precision at all times. No. Uh, so this was this very interesting. I would have expected so with all of these demands that we have had. But uh, the way to look at it is that we have six tries to get it right. We have the three reflecting mirrors and then three uh, aspherical um, optics in the camera. And Lynn Seppola at Lawrence Livermore, who did the optical design, uh, told me that it just it was an accident that it turned out to be flat. <laughs> and I, I, I still think he's lying. But um, it's a flat focal plane. And so the thing that the, the currency in this business of, of doing very wide, uh, uh, very wide uh, and deep all at the same time is uh, the French call it étendu. And uh, some American engineers call it throughput, but most of us call it étendu. And it is the product, you might imagine this should be, it's a product of the light collecting area times the field of view. So units are meter squared, degree squared. That product is what drives your ability to go wide, fast, and deep all at the same time, basically to, to survey as much sky as possible. And so here's, by example, is uh, the Keck telescope that you've probably heard of. It's a 10-meter primary mirror. And here's the field of view of the Keck telescope. And there's the moon by, for comparison in terms of angular scale. Um, here's LSST. Here's the primary mirror. And here's the field of view. And you calculate the étendue in your head of these two beasts, and there's no competition. Uh, so this is a very different kind of telescope. It allows you to go wide and fast and deep um, with good angular resolution. Another way of looking at it is to plot the étendue uh, in meter squared, degree squared, of all of the facilities that we know about that do imaging, uh, both uh, space-based and ground-based. And um, except HST, is the Hubble Space Telescope, is way over on the right here because it is tiny, tiny étendue. A little tiny field of view and a small telescope also. So it's not even here. 
But uh, these are all the telescopes that are either exist or are planned for the next 10 years. And here's LSST in terms of its étendue. Your ability to, to go to a certain flux limit and at the same time cover a certain area in the sky is proportional to the étendue. Are you going to talk at all about how you trade it off the amount of time that it takes you to survey the whole sky versus the amount of light you collect for any? That's a very good question. So, so there's a trade naturally between the amount of time that you take to survey the entire sky and the light collection. So you might say, well, I can get away with a, you know, a one meter, a two meter telescope if I, if you give me 50 years to do this. And and the Aton do. Uh, that product comes into the Etandu, and you, you can almost get away with it. The problem is that a small telescope can't go very faint very fast, and therefore you can't do the fast part of the wide, fast, deep. You could do the, the wide and the deep, maybe. Turns out you can't do the deep with a small telescope because of uh, the noise uh, in, in detectors. If detectors were totally noise-free, you could do that. But you can't do wide, fast, and deep all at the same time. In order to do fast and deep, you need to collect a lot of light per second. And, and so you need a big mirror. Is what? The Hubble, you said oh, the Hubble you're right. small and deep but with a space telescope. Can yeah. You so the way the tel Hubble telescope gets deep is they take really, really long exposures, a day long. I mean, last data I took on the Hubble telescope was several days of exposure just to go deep in a tiny field that is a, about an arc minute in size. So you have to know what you're going to look for. You go there, point there, and integrate like hell for several days. And, and um, that's a different kind of astronomy than this. So there's a, there was a great competition. Uh, there were 10 sites, really, really good sites worldwide. And it was narrowed down um, recently to one site, uh, Cerro Pachon, shown here in, in, uh, in northern Chile. Uh, in the Andes, uh, incredibly good site. And um, this is our timeline. I'll show you a better picture of it later. So we're now um, clearing ground there. This is supported by the National Science Foundation and DOE, but, but Department of Energy. Uh, but really, this is a public-private partnership. We've done a whole lot of simulations. And it's necessary when you build a really big new facility to do simulations to convince yourself, first of all, and others that you can actually do what you say you can do. And we've done simulations of how it, how it tiles the sky, how rapidly it can tile the sky, using actual real weather data from, from that site. Um, and then simulations starting at the high redshift universe, introducing a cosmology, following all of those photons all the way through as they pass by intervening over densities of dark matter through some warped cosmology through our atmosphere, which further warps images into the imperfect telescope and the imperfect detector and through our pipelines. And so we've done end-to-end uh, -end simulations uh, to show that we can do what we claim in terms of science. The survey itself is six optical bands from the ultraviolet to the near-infrared. And we're going to visit the sky. Each little piece, each little patch of the sky will be revisited 2,000 times. So in addition to going very, very deep, we will also be able to make a movie of everything that happens in the sky. And so, um, and, it, and, and also, because of the, I'll show you in a minute, because we cover so many different wave bands, we can actually have a poor man spectrometer in some sense. And because of the Hubble expansion and redshift, get a pretty good idea of the redshift or the distance to every uh, galaxy that we find. About five billion, that's wrong, it should be five billion galaxies, four to five billion galaxies with redshifts. Um, time resolution going from seconds to years, so we can, think, we can look at things move, uh, and those are sort of interesting, especially if they were to hit us uh, in 20 or 100 years, and, and things that go bump in the night at the edge of the optical universe. It's very interesting science there. Uh, so the time domain is interesting. You said this is 2,000 times revisited. That's over what period? Uh, over 10 years. So something else happens with this particular design of a telescope. Uh, you're probably all used to um, 
well, maybe not these days, but when I was a kid, you're used, used to um, equatorial mounts where you have a telescope and it just rotates around an axis. And the sky doesn't rotate on the focal plane. You can take a long time exposure and you're all set. Uh, this is an alt azimuth mount. So it moves up and down and then it moves around. And when you have an alt azimuth mount, here's an image of a piece of the sky. And two things uh, to watch for here. One is the relative orientation of the focal plane relative to the sky. And the other is the orientation of the pupil plane, which is uh, up near the uh, spider up here. And you can see the diffraction spikes on bright stars uh, due to those, the spiders. The pupil plane actually rotates at a different rate. And so if I go through this little amateur movie here of um, following a field on the sky as we go forward, you can see that the pupil plane rotates at a different rate on the detector uh, than the sky. And they both rate, uh, rotate relative to the detector. And this gives us um, superb control over systematic errors and a way of getting rid of these annoying diffraction spikes in the reconstructed image. They're just not there. How do we get the distance to distant galaxies? Here's an example. Here's these six bands in the optical going from the ultraviolet to the near infrared. And overplotted on these transmission curves of the six bands is a typical elliptical galaxy spectrum in red, starting here at redshift zero, right next door. And I move that guy further and further away. And you can see on, over on the right, if you want to follow it, on the color color plot um, where that moves, as I move that elliptical galaxy a little further away, it gets more and more redshifted. And you can see that just by the relative colors in, across these six bands, one can reproduce maybe how far away it is to some accuracy. It turns out the accuracy that, with which we can do that is about 5%, which is pretty good. How do they capture multiple colors? Do they have different kinds of pixels, or do they rotate filters in front of the We put pixels? different filters in front, not simultaneous. It turns out that that's just not possible. Um, we're very greedy. Astronomers are greedy. Uh, we want 90, in excess of 90% quantum efficiency on every image that we take. Um, so we can't split up colors that way. So there have been a lot of science drivers for this, and there are a bunch of um, reports that have put this as a high priority for the nation. Um, and I thought it would be good just to very quickly review for you what those science drivers are, and then talk more about the data and how it might be served. Because there are some, um, you know, every, it's, not, it's just not astronomers or physicists that are interested in this data. Uh, we're all, I mean, the reason I switched from one branch of physics into astronomy is because I'm really curious about the sky, you know, uh, not so much as a scientific level initially, but I just, it's interesting, it's fun. And I would like to look at the sky. Um, so this movie isn't going to run because we don't have this movie up here on this machine. But basically, um, back in the 30s, an astronomer at Caltech by the name of Fritz Zwicky found something and people figured he was crazy. And they didn't realize that he was correct. He was also crazy, as, as Rob points out. That's sometimes a necessary condition. Oh, I digress. Anyway, um, he looked at clusters of galaxies with the spectrograph. And he found that the galaxies in the clusters were zipping around in excess of the local speed limit, uh, set by saying that, OK, I'm going to assign one solar mass per solar luminosity, and that's how much mass is in that cluster, and therefore I can figure out how fast things should be moving around. And it was off by a factor of 10, and he called it dark matter, and people thought he was crazy. It turns out he was right. The universe actually is made up mostly, the matter in the universe is made up mostly of dark matter, and we are not. Dark matter, which comprises virtually all of the matter in the universe, um, uh, is made up of something other than the so-called baryons, protons, electrons, neutrons, that we're made out of. Weird. There's something even weirder, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But it would be nice to know about dark matter, chart its development, and also really nice to know about something else called dark energy. So if you look from the Earth, um, either with an Earth-based telescope like LSST or with an orbiting uh, radio telescope like WMAP, at the universe, 
you can detect different parts of the universe depending upon how, out, how far out you go. At the very beginning, of course, there was presumably a very, very hot time which was everywhere in space called the Big Bang. But the earliest moment that we can actually see is the moment when the hot Big Bang plasma had cooled to the point where electrons and protons could recombine into hydrogen, neutral hydrogen, letting free those photons. The photons then weren't hopelessly scattered and contained in that plasma. And those photons came to us and have been redshifted, stretched down in wavelength by the expansion of the universe, and appear to us now to be a microwave hiss in the microwave called the microwave background. And you can take pictures of the microwave background and have people have done that. That's our earliest vision, our earliest picture of the universe. And it shows little regions where there's more or less dark matter. So that's where our first measurement of the spectrum of dark matter comes from there. It eventually, and that was about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, by the way. Eventually, about a half a billion to a billion years later, stars and galaxies started forming through a mechanism, by the way, which we don't, we're not very sure of. Anyway, they started forming. And those, those galaxies are visible from here on the Earth, thanks to a coincidence that our atmosphere is actually able to transmit in the optical really well. You can see the edge of the optical universe from down here, throughout the optical. And so you can, you can probe the universe in various ways. And one of the very great puzzlements um, came starting in 85, but really, we weren't really shocked until around the mid-90s. Mainly, there's so much dark matter, invisible dark matter in the universe, that it really slows this huge expansion of this explosion. Sort of like if I toss a ball up in the air, it's going to come back down. Just the gravity of the dark matter slows the expansion of the universe. This slowing, this deceleration of the expansion was seen and detected. And we all believed that the universe was slowing down. However, uh, recently, uh, there's been a couple of lines of evidence that have shown us that the universe has changed its mind in the last few billion years and is beginning to accelerate its expansion again. And this is, this is what we call dark energy, which means we don't understand it, so we had to give it a name. But we don't know what it is. It's something in the nature of space-time, some new field, which at this late stage in the universe, this very dilute universe that we have now compared to where it was originally, at this late stage in the universe dominates the energy budget and somehow has negative pressure and negative gravity and causes the universe to fly apart. That blows my mind and a lot of others, and um, that's, um, for many of us, a driving motivation, but there are a lot of other, there's a lot of other cool astronomy that this does. So what about dark energy? This is our resident theorist. So there are various um, scenarios for the scale factor of the universe as a function of time. They all start with some kind of huge big bang about 13, 0.8 years, a uh, billion years ago. But they all have different time scenarios. One, uh, the so-called recollapsing universe has been ruled out. But that was very much alive up until the 90s, I think. Um, then there was the critical universe we all believed. We all believed in the critical universe where it just kept, just very, very finely tuned, kept on coasting. Uh, then there's a different kind of coasting universe that some of us believed in for a while. And now we're forced to believe in this wacky universe that starts by decelerating and then changes its mind. And so if you wait long enough in our current cosmology, everything will be infinitely far away and protons will decay and there'll be nothingness. So it's, you know, um, sort of a lonely prospect. So how do you actually measure this stuff, really? One way is to see how uh, light from these distant galaxies is moved around in the sky. So, for example, imagine that you're over on the right over here somewhere, and you're looking out through a universe composed of lumpy dark matter. And as time proceeded from the distant past to the more recent past, the lumpiness becomes greater. Structure forms as a function of cosmic time simply by self-gravitational buildup. 
dark, more dark matter attracts more dark matter, gets bigger density with time. And so you imagine the light from one of those distant galaxies uh, passing by these overdensities of dark matter getting deflected by gravity. Einstein taught us that light is deflected by gravity. And so you use the general theory of relativity as a tool to try to understand what the distribution of dark matter is and what it's doing as a function of cosmic epoch. And this is called 3D tomography, 3D mass tomography. Uh, so I'm not going to show you this movie. This is all on our website, which I'll show you at the end, uh, lsst.org. But basically, this is the effect that you see. You have an overdensity of dark matter, invisible in this picture and invisible in reality. And what it does is it, it, it causes this funny kind of distortion of, distant, of this universe around the center of the overdensity of dark matter. And images, a galaxy that would have appeared here actually is moved out to here and appears out here instead, and it gets distorted in this way. And I can show you in the next uh, image here um, really a very simple cartoon of how that happens. It's a really simple idea. So you're down here. There's a huge overdensity of dark matter here. And here's this law-abiding, nice little round, distant blue galaxy out there. And each one of its pixels appears at a new place in the sky by Einstein's light bending formula. This little pixel gets moved out here, this little pixel move, gets moved out here, and you get this banana. This characteristic shear is um, a diagnostic of the distribution of the dark matter. If you take this away, you see the galaxy here. If you put this matter here, you see a distorted image of the galaxy here. And the amount of distortion is a function of two things. Um, you can, this, you, can do, you can do this just simply by dimensional analysis. You don't even have to know relativity. Uh, it's a function of the distances. If I, if I put a lens right up here next to my eye, it's not very effective. And I put it right up next to the candle or the source, it's not very effective. The best place to have a lens is in the middle. And so it's proportional. The amount of shear here, distortion, is proportional to the ratio of distances here. But it's also proportional to the amount of mass. If I let the mass shrink to zero, there's no distortion. And so it's from this term here, it's proportional to a product of cosmology and gravity. Gravity comes in big G. Um, and this one just, just is a function of the cosmology. And so there's a mix of large scale dark matter structure evolving with cosmic time and cosmology in these measurements. And there are a whole lot of other things you can measure, but this is, this is, this is fun. You're probably used to seeing uh, images like this that are basically, sh uh, basically are images of light or radiation. So I could have told you this as well. This is an x-ray picture of the sky. But this is not radiation. This is a mass picture. This is the real data that we have now from an existing experiment, a pilot experiment, 20 square degrees, doing this 3D mass tomography. This is a slice in cosmic time of the mass distribution looking out in this little part of the universe, two by two degrees on the side. So the moon's about yay big. Um, and these, over, these are over densities of dark matter in that little distant slice. And we confirmed them by looking uh, with X-ray telescopes at them and seeing the very hot, the X-rays coming from the hot electrons at the bottom of this deep gravitational potential well. Uh, so we can map we can map the mass density of the universe at, um, in different different distance um, slices, and then therefore chart the development of cosmic dark matter structure. It's a question. So what do you do for electric distances to the ah, dark matter? Um, that was that color redshift, which I went through all too fast. Oh, okay. the poor man spectrogram. So for each one of those billions of distant galaxies, you have a lot of color information you know, across these six bands. And you can reconstruct with some accuracy what its distance is if you have the right, if, if you have the right template for its rest frame spectral distribution. Oh, so that gives you what you're looking at, but yeah. the dark matter in between. Ah, so, so how do you reconstruct? OK, let me go back. That's a good question. So here is where the center of this pile of dark matter is. So uh, the way I developed this algorithm back in 1980 or so is it's really a very simple idea. Mainly, 
If there's no dark matter here, you won't have this characteristic alignment. If there is, you will, and the amount of this alignment, or shear, is directly proportional to how much dark matter you have here. So imagine, imagine splitting a piece of the sky up into a little a, a grid of dots. Around each dot, you ask the question, how much, how much tangential alignment of distant galaxy images do I have? And that's a simple integral of the uh, ellipticity. And you just do that calculation. And you do that calculation, and it returns a scalar number. It's the number for each one of those points. And that's an image. And that's an image, it turns out, calibratable image of this dark matter. That's how it's made. It's a very simple forward interval. There's no inverse problem with regularization requirements, whatnot. So it's a lot of fun. And it happens, it, it's a very fast calculation. So this also probes the physics of this mysterious dark energy because if we are able to trace this development of cosmic structure all the way from the um, decoupling in the microwave background, only 300,000 years after the Big Bang, all the way up to the present, uh, that's a huge number of constraints on the cosmology, and in particular, the physics of dark energy. Here's a better way of looking at it. Um, imagine that you have two very distant galaxies, not necessarily physically associated, but close in angle on the sky, and you follow the light from them as it passes by and through intervening over densities of dark matter to you down here. For galaxies that are close by an angle, uh, the, the, the deflections are, the light from them suffers very similar deflections and therefore their induced ellipticities due to these deflections are correlated um, and are uncorrelated with uh, the same sort of thing somewhere else on the sky. And so you might imagine that the shear, shear or ellipticity, ellipticity two point correlation functions can tell you a lot about the intervening um, dark matter spectrum. And then if, in addition to all of that, you can do this as a function of redshift, of distance, which is what we do using this poor man's spectrometer of color redshifts, then you can untangle all of the effects and have a very precise measure of the physics of both dark energy and dark matter. So this is just one of the things this beast will do. There are a lot of them. Uh, we will survey 20 to 30,000 square degrees of the sky, do this 4, 4D reconstruction of about 4 to 5 billion galaxies, which means that in principle we can render, have a, have a, have a 4D rendering uh, movie that you could swim through of the, of, the, of the 3D universe as a function of cosmic time. In the time domain, um, we will detect and measure the orbits of 100,000 asteroids. This is a public service. It's also some science in there. Um, some of them are, have our name on them, I think. Um, uh, a million supernovae, a lot of science there. And probably more important than any of these things we can't even, questions we can't even ask. Because we're looking, we're opening a new window in the sky uh, over current facilities by about a factor of a thousand in the time domain. Um, so here's the near Earth objects. There's a threatening picture of one here. Uh, our solar system inventory is, is woefully incomplete. Uh, this will finish the inventory all the way down to 150 meter rocks. Below that size, they burn up in the atmosphere, pretty much. Um, but it demands LSST or something like it. You want to have short exposures because if it's longer than about 15 seconds, they, they trail during the exposure. You can't gain depth by integrating longer. Uh, you, have, you have to go very faint in that period of time. So that's the high, the high Aton Dew requirements needed for this, strangely enough, also. Uh, so how do you find things that go bump in the night? Well, you take an image and then you compare what you found in that image with a archival image of the same piece of the sky. And you take the, the, the simplest and dumbest things is you register them, um, uh, warp them onto the same coordinate system and then subtract them. And something that is new is uh, new. <laughs> and so that's how it works. Here's an example from our current survey. Before, during, and difference. And bang, you have a visitor object. Um, we've discovered these things recently. They're not supernovae. Um, we don't know what they are. LSST will find lots of them. 
Maybe we'll find out what they are. Here's some more. Before, during, difference. Um, a new class of objects, probably. Mm -hmm. A laser point. Yeah, another, another uh, civilization. Yeah. So maybe they're trying to tell us something. So LSST, extrapolating from what we have now found, uh, should find about 10,000 of these every night. So that's cool. Um, so we've done these simulations, which I think I showed you before. So massively parallel astrophysics is the key word, take home message scientifically from this. Um, probably the most important thing that it will be remembered for is not on this list, but here are some things that people would like to do with this machine. Going all the way from the Earth to the solar system to the history of the assembly of our galaxy and its local group to um, galaxies in general, how galaxies formed to the mysteries of dark matter and dark energy. So data. Um, a small word for a big problem. Uh, six bands, five at a time, that is to say we can get five of these big filters which have about the size and weight of a manhole cover inside of the camera all at the same time. So we can, in 30 seconds we can move one of these filters in place. Um, we observe in pairs of 15 second exposures, two second readout, um, se separated by a five second slew. This thing is busy and it, and it uh, tiles the sky every few nights and just relentlessly continues to do this for 10 years in different color bands. It goes very faint. If any of you are astronomers, uh, you'll notice that that is pretty faint. Uh, and it goes faint in 15 seconds. It goes to the edge of the optical universe in 15 seconds. Um, so, um, <laughs> I was debating whether to show this slide here, actually, because you know astronomers look at the word petabytes in their eyes. You know they they, they don't know how to gra grapple with these concepts. Uh, this is probably not an appropriate slide to show at Google, but I mean this is this is so much more data than we folks are used to handling. It's it's um, it's not even funny. Actually, the high energy physics community is beginning to contemplate handling petabytes a year. And, and so it's, it, it turns out not to be all that scary. But one of the things that we do have to do on the fly, which is a little scary, is we actually have to extract knowledge in real time from this much data. That's an interesting software assignment, especially if you don't know what question to ask. Uh, you don't want to design an experiment to exclude new science. And so, I mean, the most obvious thing is the most obvious thing is just to do one of those science experiments that was on that list of massively parallel astrophysics. You could put blinders on, design your pipeline, software pipelines, do that, and go home. But how do you find something that you didn't expect? How do you design software that will do that? Uh, you'll be monitoring roughly 10 billion objects for variations. Um, it's a nice assignment. This is our concept of what we think we have to do. Uh, we have to have a lot of compute capability on the mountain uh, to get rid of the instrumental, instrumental signature and also to um, look at the health of the, uh, of the machine. We actually have to come up with alerts on the fly within seconds. So we have to do this image differencing stuff in seconds. And then we have to do a lot of this very much more complicated analysis for all these other science drivers, and particularly the cosmology part, uh, in a very big facility somewhere. And then we have to serve it to the world, us uh, scientists, but I think more importantly, to the world in general. Here are some estimates of data volume. Uh, so in terms of raw data, 16-bit data, unprocessed, about 15 terabytes a day. And um, here's how you do that calculation. We actually have to do some instrumental uh, signature removal. So that increases, the, uh, that increases the size a bit. And it very quickly gets turned into 32-bit images, of course. And then we can compress it a bit. There's also 
a metadata catalog. There's information that you learn from these images that you put into some kind of flat file catalog system or something. Where an object is, what its shape is, what its colors are, did it change in time. Uh, something like two kilobytes of information per object, information that you get, and you can put it in the catalog, which has a size roughly 10% of the size of the images. And it's from such a catalog that you might actually, at, at Google, if you really wanted to um, um, render a, a four-dimensional universe that, that people could swim through, it would be from that catalog probably, not the images themselves. You can actually reconstruct images if you have enough information in your catalog perfectly decent looking images from the catalog alone. Um, at the highest application uh, layer in the software, there's, uh, of course, the data acquisition, image processing pipelines to get rid of the in, in, uh, instrumental signature, um, difference imaging that goes on. Uh, a whole lot of different steps have to happen pretty much all at the same time. So we have a requirement, which probably will get modified in the wrong direction, mainly shorter, that within 60 seconds, we actually have to deliver a data product to the world, a believable data product, which is this object changed its luminosity or color or moved on the sky by such and such at a certain time, within 60 seconds. It'll probably go down to 30. Oh, what would be, so um, suppose that you're interested in the science of gamma ray bursters, which are weird things that pop off in the gamma ray, and then you see an optical signature of this thing. They're not really understood, but if you had a lot of statistical data on the optical signature of gamma ray bursters, um, you could uh, get some science out of it. And particularly if you had it fresh enough that you could point a gamma ray or an X-ray telescope at that place. This is sort of the reverse of what is normally done now, very in inefficiently. Um, if you were interested in getting the orbits of, of asteroids, you have to actually get lots of observations of this rock so that you can pick it out of the haystack, which is the main belt asteroid population, which is huge. So we have a significant noise background in Earth-crossing asteroids earth-threatening asteroids detection from the main belt asteroids. And you, 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 need to, you, need to, you need to run that, uh, we call it the disambiguator. It's an inverse problem. You need to run that image to orbits calculation really quickly. And, so, and you don't want to lose the thing. So at an infrastructure level, um, the telescope will be down here. Uh, but we've got to get the data back up here um, in some way on some time scale. So the mountain will have to, uh, the camera reads out in, in two seconds, maybe one second, we'll see, but certainly less than two seconds. That data has to go down to the base station through a 10 gigabit, gigabit uh, per second link, which is here. This is probably in La Serena, seacoast town. Uh, there, there's more compute capability. Um, here, in this building, this is boring. Uh, but it's something that we have to have. And this is where some of the transient alerts will, will get created. Um, then we have to get information, all of that data back stateside. And then we have to serve it in some way to the scientific community, and more importantly, to everybody. Um, seven petabytes per year. And some folks, not your average high school student, but some folks will be doing sufficiently complicated calculations on this data that they don't, they're not going to be happy with just the catalog. They're going to have the catalog and then they're going to want to do a calculation based back on the individual images. So they're going to do some calculation using the seven petabytes of data. And it probably is going to be a non-local calculation. So lots of teraflops have to be available for that activity. Um, but that's a very small, on the other hand, that's a very small part 
of the total user base. Most people, most of the, most of the hits are going to be from people that are just curious about the sky and want to swim through the sky. So how do you do that? This is a very amateurish way of doing this. So a bunch of us sat down at the um, Hayden Planetarium last year, try to figure out how, how we could, through their so-called digital universe, how we could serve this data to the public. And we took the sort of the worst case scenario, we degrade the resolution so that you just have a barely acceptable image, compress it in a lossy fashion, and then serve this. This is not very much fun to uh, even many casual users, but you can do it. And you could do it um, with about 180 gigabytes uh, database uh, times three, by the way, because there's so many, there's six bands, and so you have basically a, a, a um, RGB color three times. So say three times 200 gigabytes um, in JPEGs. And maybe in 2010 or 2013, you could download that four billion galaxies. But the real photometric catalog that a lot of people are going to want to use is this guy here, 10 to 100 terabytes, depending upon whether it's the first year or the 10th year of operation. So clearly, however, the right way to do this is to do it professionally and have people gain access to the sky uh, through this Google Sky capability. So basically this machine, you can view this machine as a transformer. It's basically transforming the sky to disk farms and then, it's, and then the fun starts. So nowadays we have telescope assignment committees and we apply for our three nights on some you know, Keck telescope and uh, have a 10% chance of success per attempt and there's a committee that assigns time. There presumably will be a floor space assignment committee uh, for some of the computation, that will high-end computation that will be done on this data. Um, so different. Uh, the other thing that's different about, about this project and any other astronomy project that I'm aware of at the moment is that the data is not proprietary. This gives me as director a hell of a time raising private funding for this from participating universities because the dean will always ask, well, what's in it for our professors if everybody could get this data, if our competition in Germany can get this data? Uh, what's in it, of course, is familiarity and being close to the, close to the, the beast itself. But it is public, and it will be, um, it, it, it's sort of a, a different idea, it's sort of open source, open data, all of our software. Um, can be um, sort of the Linux model. So here's something fun that I thought I'd finish with. Mainly a little piece of the sky. This is uh, eight arc minutes across. Um, this is a piece of the sky that just by chance overlaps between some photographic plates that were taken some 50 years ago. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey and our current survey the deep lens survey, and it just gives you a feel for uh, how rich in depth and, and features and information um, the sky um, can become if you go deeper. So here's um, digitized photographic plates. These were taken with the Schmidt telescope on Mount Palomar in the 60s, and two bands, so you can form a sort of um, color from it, color image, JPEG image. And in the next image is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, data release four, uh, showing these same galaxies and a few other bright stars and galaxies and whatnot. And by the way, it's sort of fun if you blink between them. Take a look at this star here. This is 60 years. That guy's moving. Stars do move, and particularly nearby subluminous red stars are trucking right along. And then if you take a look at that same patch of the sky with the deep lens survey, this is what we have 
with our existing facility, not much exposure, only 20 exposures. And you're looking out nearly to the edge of the optical universe. Uh, there are some artifacts in these, uh, in these state-of-the-art images with existing facilities that won't be present, as I mentioned, in the LSST imaging because of the fact the focal plane, because of the fact that the sky rotates in the focal plane between your hundreds of images in any one band. And that is two things, the diffraction spikes, which actually in this light you cannot see very well from the, from the stars, and uh, something called blooming, which is the star is so bright that electrons are flowing out of the potential well of that pixel and just happily going down the column. And uh, both of those effects will be suppressed extremely well uh, by having a whole collection of images that are rotated. Um, now, this does not go quite as deep um, as LSST. It's about a factor of four less deep than LSST will do. And it's also a factor of uh, roughly two poorer angular resolution. So um, imagine, you know, this. The difference between going from Sloan to Deep Lens Survey, imagine that difference again, pretty much, with LSST data. And then, on top of that sort of two-dimensional color information, you add another dimension, mainly, mainly time or distance. So you can make a, um, a movie. You can do celestial cinematography. You can have overlays of things that move, like the star, or, or other things that are changing in brightness popping off, but you can also reconstruct the full three-dimensional arrangement of all of these galaxies and swim through them if you want. You can, you can, you can reconstruct that from the redshift information, and that would be a fun tool. So here's our timeline. Um, I'll finish now. Um, we are here. Uh, it's going to cost us about $40 million to do our design and development. And we have some of it, a little over half of it, in place through a combination of uh, private and federal grants. Um, then construction will be $300 million, And then operations, about $20 million. So far, two volunteers for that. DOE and, uh, DOE and the NSF, but NASA is also interested because of the asteroid problem. Um, so we're near, nearing the end of the first R&D phase where we are prepared now. We know how to build this beast, we think. We've done a lot of tests, simulations. We are putting in a construction proposal in the next couple of months uh, to both agencies, invited construction proposal to both agencies. And we expect to see um, some light through this machine somewhere around 2012, science operations probably in 2013. In just the first year of operations, the entire visible sky will be done to this depth, plus the uh, distance information, plus the time information. And it'll just get better and deeper as the years march by. So. Um, it'll be fun uh, from the point of view, really, of turning people on to science. So here's where you can go for more information. Thanks. Questions? Yeah. So what proportion of the science will this thing do by itself? Do in uh, the first six months? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good question. Years. So. That's a really good. Um, so everyone's asking in the scientific community, what, what portion of each one of those lists of science topics, mass, massively parallel astrophysics lists that I showed, how much of each one of those scientific missions will this machine do as a function of time in the first six months, in the first year, et cetera? And it varies, but uh, a lot of the science, a lot of the science gets done in the first few years. So it's sort of a, an exponential kind of thing. Some of it depends on, on the full, some of, some of the questions that you might ask depend on the full 10 years of data, but a lot of it, a lot of it gets done in the first year or two. What happens in 2024? Oh, what happens when we're, um, I think, we'll see. 
you know, we'll learn something that we don't expect now, and that will drive our decisions in 2024. Thanks.